Keep trying to find a spot. I turn it too much and it goes too high. How's that? We can turn it up a little bit more if we need to. We can turn it up even higher. It's not going to be my problem. 
Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. And chapter number 30. Trying to look just for a moment. There's nine verses in chapter 31. There's 20 verses in 32. It's only 24 verses in 33, 17 and 34. We are, we are not very far away as far as distance is concerned. With some elements not of prediction or prophecy, foretelling or forthtelling, the two Gen general paths we give for description of what a, a prophet of the Old Testament did, but where we will uh, careen back into some some history. Uh, it is, I believe, in chapter 36 where we start talking about uh, King Hezekiah uh, and Sennacherib and the, the Assyrian forces coming uh, from the north and the Babylonian uh, emissaries coming from the east. So we, we've got some history that is coming in only a couple of chapters. We are looking at chapter 30, though, of the, the stubbornness, the rebelliousness of God's people. We're looking at their, their failures in that they refuse to trust in God, and they put their trust in human beings. Not in themselves, although in a way, I guess you could think it, it seems as if they trust in themselves because they trust themselves to make decisions for themselves. They trust that they know what is best. And in their own thoughts and assumptions as to what they know is best, they have made alliances with outside nations. Now, when you're looking at the statements that they make to the prophets, look at verses 8 through 11 real quickly. And what does it sound like to us? What does it give us a, a memory of in our Bible study elsewhere. Specifically verse 10. Who say to the seers, do not see. And to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. What does that sound like? Sorry? 2 Timothy 4. People who, because they their ears want to hear different things, uh, they'll just go find somebody that will give them the different things. <clears throat> if you only turn back one page in your Bibles, uh, you'll note a verse that we have mentioned uh, from time to time at least. We, we note the, the genesis uh, of this phrase. We are familiar with it in the New Testament. But chapter 29 and verse 13, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Uh, we know this perhaps from Mark chapter 7, uh, verses 6 and 7. Jesus says, well, hath Isaiah prophesied uh, about you. Why was that? Because the leaders of Jesus' people, the leaders of the Jews uh, in the first century, were teaching a mix, some of God's words and some of their words. I can't verify this. I don't know this for sure. I'm not sure if this is verifiable, uh, but I have heard I'm sure I have read it at some point along the way, that on top of the 613 laws that God had given to his people through Moses, that the Pharisees had added some six or 700 more on top of that. Uh, you look specifically in the book of Mark and the, the discussions they're having as to, to why they are, are forsaking Jesus' disciples or forsaking the tradition of the elders. And what was Jesus' response? Jesus' response isn't to rebuke his disciples for forsaking the tradition of the elders. He said, why do you forsake the tradition, the teaching, the instruction of God by your tradition? So what they had done is they had taken laws, ideas, precepts, themes that they enjoyed, that they believed in, that maybe they had created through the rabbinical tradition over the years, and they had started using those to replace sections of God's word. You see the same type of mindset here in Isaiah chapter 30. All right, let's go ahead and look at verses 15 to 17. Just a little bit of a, a review. We're not going to spend any more time on that. Verses 15 to 17, God's desire for repentance. Somebody would read for us Isaiah 30, 
15 to 17. Okay, thank you. When you look at verse 15, it starts with, this is very important, it starts with what? I know it's elementary, but it starts with, thus says the Lord. I don't know how many times that's mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the Bible. I don't know how many times we see that in the Old Testament, uh, but that is a, a notable phrase anytime we see it. Not only does it says, thus says the Lord, but it also says God. I don't know this. Uh, I have to go back and actually look at this. I haven't looked at it, but I'm assuming since it says, thus says the Lord God, uh, that it's uh, thus says the Lord is probably what they call the Tetragrammaton. It's probably the what what is uh, referred to as Yahweh or where we get our word Jehovah. Uh, and then it says God. I'm assuming that's Elohim. I haven't looked at the Hebrew, but I'm, I'm assuming it is probably. If you're reading through uh, Hebrew with uh, anybody who is uh, who is Jewish or in, in a Hebrew class uh, reading type setting, uh, you wouldn't pronounce the Tetragrammaton. You would pronounce it at an I. So I'm assuming this text, somebody's free to pull up their Bible hub if they would like to. Uh, I'm assuming this is probably Adonai Elohim. But even then, it doesn't end there. It goes even further in describing him. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. What, what, what does that imply when you see it would have been enough, would it not, for God to say, thus says the Lord? So what does it mean just naturally? What might we assume when Isaiah says, thus says the Lord God, and then he includes in that, thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. What? Anybody have any thoughts? Supreme? Okay. Doubly important. Anybody else? Just, just looking for thoughts. Is it interesting? I know it is, so I shouldn't ask the question. But is it interesting to you, and can you explain why it's interesting, perhaps, that he then describes Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, as the Holy One of Israel? Any thoughts as to why that phrase is included? It's okay if somebody gets it wrong. The worst is you'll just get it wrong. <laughs> Just look, just looking for for thoughts. It's not necessarily a right wrong. I have some, I have some thoughts circulating. But go ahead. Okay, he's in power and he knows best. Anybody else? What 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 kind of what kind of uh, impression does the phrase "the Holy One of Israel" make? Think specifically in this setting. He's their God, okay? Now, we know as we read through the scriptures, especially as we get into the New Testament, uh, is he the God of the Jews only or also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, but that, that's not really uh, what we're stating here. We're stating here that they were his chosen people. He has used them for a specific purpose. He has been their God. He wants them to be his people. And yet throughout many generations, what have they done? They have attempted to keep him at arm's length. They don't want to do away with God altogether. Well, they still want what the God of heaven will give them. They still want the protection. They still want the love. They still want the, the blessings. They still want the country. But they want to do all of those things and be able to honor him and worship him and think about him their way on their terms. So they're kind of just trying to keep God at, at arm's length. What else? Any other thoughts? Why else do you think the Holy One of Israel might be mentioned there? 
Let's think about this just for a moment. Let me mention a couple of suggestions. You can agree, disagree. We can discuss it if you'd like. What was unique about the Israelite Hebrew people in their setting, in the ancient Near East, in the 6th century B.C., in the 10th century B.C., in the 15th century B.C.? What was unique about them? as compared to all of the nations that surrounded them. Sorry? God's chosen people. What else? You may think of another reason that made them unique. Okay. They had they had unique worship for sure. Some of those things, um, they they there's some there are certainly some places of worship, like temples and, and things like that, but certainly the way they were worshiping was unique. Anybody think of anything else? What made them stand out religiously? Okay, they had a God that dealt well with them. The relationship that they had with, with God was very different than the relationship that the... Exactly, they were monotheistic. Uh, the other nations have a variety of gods. Uh, whether it's two or three or in the in the case of what we've discussed with Egypt, uh, Egypt has been ha said to have had possibly thousands of different gods. Uh, there is a there's a verse in Numbers. There's also a verse in Exodus. I don't remember the verse in Exodus off the top of my head. I believe it's somewhere around chapter 12, but somebody can go find that if they like where it seems as if God himself even says that what he's doing to Egypt in the, the ten plagues was at least in part directed toward his supremacy over their gods, over their deities, because they had a variety of these. They've got a, a god of this and a god of that and a god of this and all of these other things. And so what God is showing, much like when Aaron throws his staff down, it becomes what? It becomes a snake, a serpent, whatever you want to call it. So uh, Pharaoh's magicians uh, you know, attempt to do the same type of thing, and then what happens? His, his eats theirs. And so what, what again, is that this, this sort of sign of? Is that sign of supremacy? So the same thing is happening, showing God's power as true God, as uh, the only God uh, over these deities uh, of, the, of the Egyptians. Uh, the, other, the other verse, if you'd like to take that down, uh, double check this just in case I get this wrong and give you bad information. I believe it's Numbers 2433. I'll go ahead while I'm thinking about it and look and see if I can find that verse in Exodus very quickly. Let's look in chapter 12. Okay, uh, I'll I'll go look in just a second. I'm trying to let me find the one in Exodus first. I'll have to I'll have to find it for you, I guess, a little bit later on. I wanted to mention those two verses. Oh, there we go. Uh, Exodus 12, 12 is that one. And if I can't find you the one in in numbers, I'll I'll find it later on. But I wanted to mention both of those two for you. So, yeah, I'll have to come back. I'll, I'll find it. So was there anything else? I, I personally have at least uh, another thought or two. Any, any other reason as to why we might see the phrase uh, Holy One of Israel in that verse?
It's 33-4 in numbers, by the way. Let me ask this question now. What immediately follows in verse 15, the statement of the Lord God of Israel, the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel? He says, thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, and then he makes an entreaty, doesn't he? Then he invites them to something. What is it? In returning and rest, you should be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength, but you would not. What does it mention? What does it imply? We're not going to spend too much time talking about this, but God offers them an opportunity to be back in a sound relationship with him. God does not have to do that. They have broken the covenant. They have defiled his covenant. They've forsaken him. They've kept him in the arm's length. They've turned their eyes away from him. And so what was just of God? It's loving and compassionate and merciful and gracious of God to accept them back. But if they refuse to come back, what does God's justice, holiness demand? God's justice demands there is some punishment for it. I can't help but wonder if that has something to do with, thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. They may not like what's coming, but God is certainly clearly within the boundaries of holiness and justice in his activities because he has begged them and begged them and waited. After they have broken the covenant multiple times, God has still stood there long sufferingly. God has still stood there patiently. They still have kept him at arm's length. God's holiness demands that God's justice be meted out. That is one of the reasons why uh, I, I love I love so much. Uh, I, if, again, I, I'll, I'll throw a verse out there, and if I get this wrong, somebody please, please correct me. I don't want to give you bad information. I believe it's Romans 3.26. We don't have time to talk about that in, in depth this morning. But in Romans 3.26, it talks about that he is the just and the justifier. Now, there's a lot uh, about the role of God and the role of Jesus the Lord and how that works for us. God's justice demands that our sins be punished. So God's justice was meted out, but how was God's justice satisfied? God's the one that paid the price for that justice to be satisfied. We, we didn't have to do that. So God was just in that punishment was meted out for our sins, but God was also the justifier in that he's the one that paid that price. So God's justice is being meted out against God's people here because he has begged them, but they would not. Does this verse remind you of any other verses? I'll mention a couple to you. We're not going to spend too much time looking at all of them. Uh, but write down, if you're taking notes, Matthew 23, 37. That one should be very familiar to us, right? Jesus I believe Luke reports that he, he weeps over Jerusalem. What did Jesus say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who killest the prophet, stonest them which I have sent to you. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her, I think the one in Luke says brood, uh, under her wings, and you are not willing. He calls them, he begs them, he entreats them, he invites them, and they, they simply uh, were not willing. Now, to, to make a connection here, uh, we're not going to stay here too long, but this is an interesting connection, is it not? What does God's holiness and justice that's about to play out here, what connection does that have to what Jesus was saying in the New Testament? Those Jews also, would they not? We're going to receive recompense for the way that they treated Jesus. Their city would fall. Their city would be destroyed. All right, also write these verses down. Jeremiah 6 and 16. This is talking about not this generation in Isaiah, but a very soon arriving generation. Isaiah and Jeremiah are about 100 years apart in their work. Jeremiah 6, 16 is what? Where they're supposed to stand in the way, look for the old paths, walk in it. And there they'd find rest, salvation. Uh, I forget exactly. Uh, but what's the last phrase in that verse? The same thing we find here in the last part of this verse. The same thing we find in the last part of 2337. They didn't want to. Said, but you would not. So then write down for our last verse there, 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 11. 
God reminded the people here of what they had refused. If they had repented, they would have had rest or quietness. All right. So we're almost to the time. I told you we're a couple of chapters away from when we meet Sennacherib versus Hezekiah, which is really Sennacherib versus God. And when that happens, who wins? God won. What did God do? God protected Jerusalem and would not allow the Assyrian forces to enter. With God having shown that he was willing to, and certainly we know capable of doing that, could God have prevented what Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army wanted to do? Sure. God could have, would have, I believe, spared his people from that if they had only turned, but they refused to. They were were adamant about their their activity, their their refusal. So God reminds them they would have had rest or quietness, which was the opposite of anxiety that we're about to see in the next couple of verses. Repentance would have resulted in salvation from their enemies, which would have created what? A greater trust in God. It would have healed the whole whole process because if if they repented, if they turned back to God, God saved them from their enemies, then what would they possibly do the next time they got in trouble? Well, relying on God worked for us last time. Let's do that again. But now that they went negative and said, we're going to rely on somebody else, and yet they never seem to want to break that cycle, do they? Verses 16 and 17, we know that they refused to do so. They saw salvation through their own means by seeking alliance with their neighbors. We know that they put their their trust and their faith in the nations around them and their armies rather than trusting in God. What's the the, the impact of verses 16 and 17? You said, no, no what? No, we're not going to come back. No, we're not going to do it your way. No, we're, we're going to flee on horses. So then how does God respond? God says, well, you'll definitely flee. You won't flee the way you think you're going to flee, but you'll definitely flee. There and we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee. What, what, what's the impression there? Remember when the Bible tells us God chose this people? Did God choose this people because they look better than the other people? Did God choose these people because they had the right color skin? Did God choose these people because they were more crafty and creative than other people? Because they were more uh, religiously pure than other people? Because they were intellectually superior to other people? Why does Deuteronomy tell us God chose this people? Because they were small. And because through them, God could show his power and glory. So what's happening here? What is God actually going to allow to happen? God's going to allow them to be the small, weak people that they were when he used them, when he called them, when he began to to implement his plan through this family. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one. Now, whether that's a literal number, what does it imply to us? Maybe it's a a flowery, poetic type of, of phrase. All it means is they have no path to victory. They're not going to be able to withstand the the army, the force that's going to come against them. And then verse 17, how thorough is their defeat going to be? Does anybody remember a time in the Old Testament when there was an army that surrounded a city of God's people? And there were some lepers that weren't really allowed in the city, but they were afraid to go to the enemy because if they went to the enemy, maybe they'd just kill them, but that's better than just starving. So they went out and they figured, well, let's go ahead and just give ourselves to the enemy anyway. So they go out to the enemy, and what do they find? Nothing. Well, that's not true. They find no people. They find spoils. They find what? Tents, food, weapons, all the things we could imagine. What's, what's the impression given by verse 17 here? The army has run away, the horses are gone, the chariots are gone, the leaders are gone, and God's people are left as what? As the standard, as the flag that would be carried at the beginning of that that army as they continue to march. That pole that was planted in the ground that marked where their armies were stationed, that's the only thing left waving in the wind. God's people aren't there. There, There's no power there. There's no support there. So you are left as a pole on top of a mountain and as a banner on a hill. God means they they have been neglected. What does it mean? Egypt's not going to keep them secure. Uh, They they are representing this this pole. So the army that would be there with them is not going to be able to help them. 
the, the army's not going to give them any sort of any sort of actual support. Write down a couple of verses if you're, you're taking down notes. Write down Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. This verse has a wide variety of applications, but it certainly fits here. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that he will also reap. That's exactly what was about to happen to God's people. And then also write down Romans chapter 1. We're not going to go read this, but I think it's an interesting verse to include. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Anybody remember the content? Not to quote any part of it, but do you remember the content of Romans 1, 18 to 25? People who had heard from God, who had knowledge of God, they did not want to pursue that knowledge. They lived the way they wanted. So what did God allow happen? God allowed them to deteriorate in the way they were going. God allowed them to do what they wanted. God allowed them to continually corrupt themselves. That's what God was going to do here. God wasn't going to make his people be faithful. He invited them to be. He entreated them to be. He encouraged them to be. He instructed them to be. Through the prophets, he even warned them to be. But ultimately, what was God going to do? Let them be their own people. God was going to let them make their own decisions. All right, look at verse 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore, he will be exalted that he may, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Isn't it interesting that verse 18 says he's a God of justice. And in verse 15, it started with the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. So we see this idea of justice still coming back. Isaiah here lists some of the attributes of God. He possesses these qualities in perfect measure. He is just, but he also desires what? To me, one of the most frustrating incidents in the Bible, one of the saddest texts in the Bible, is Jonah chapter 4. You know, maybe maybe in, in kids' classes, we have, the, we have the story. I don't like using the word story. Y'all know that. We have the story of Jonah, okay? So God tells Jonah, go. Jonah doesn't go. Jonah runs. God finds him. Fish eats him. Fish spits him up. He goes ahead and goes to Nineveh. Everything works out. Nineveh repents, and everybody's happy. I'm not sure how many of our children's books include Jonah chapter 4. Because Jonah doesn't end well. Jonah is not a book with a happy ending. In fact, Jonah is a book with a, if you know the history, a, a sad ending. Because not only is Jonah not right with God, but eventually the Assyrians, we, uh, we have to assume, fall out of whatever it is that they had attempted to do, their repentance in Jonah chapter 3, because they're, they're overtaken by the, the Babylonians. Uh, not, not too long after that, Jonah was very likely in the, the early 8th century, and Nineveh falls uh, to Babylon in the uh, the late 7th century. So it, it's still 100 and, and plus years away before they fall. But does anybody remember how the book of Jonah ends? What is, how does Jonah react in chapter 4? I, I noticed that. Does anybody remember how Jonah reacts? Uh, turn your volume down. Hit, hit the button on the side. You know, certain people in technology just, just don't mix. <laughs> uh, anybody remember what Jonah says? Think about somebody who is supposed to love God. It's supposed to be connected to God. It's supposed to be a mouthpiece for God. And Jonah is so upset that Nineveh is given the opportunity to repent. He's mad in uh, chapter 4 at the beginning of it. And God comes to him. God says, do you do well to be angry? And Jonah essentially says, well, I have full right to be angry. Jonah is, th this idiom I'm sure didn't exist back in Jonah's day. Uh, but this idiom definitely exists in our days. Uh, Jonah we, we may, uh, in, in our modern uh, vernacular, we, we may call Jonah a drama queen. Because Jonah essentially is so upset, Jonah says, God just killed me. I'm so upset, I'd rather just, he'd rather be dead than see Nineveh 
be offered that repentance by God. And Jonah says, I knew you to be. Jonah essentially says, I told you so. Of all the strong things somebody could stand before God and say, that's one of the more, can you imagine not expecting fire or lightning or something to come down right at that moment when Jonah essentially tells God, I told you so. Didn't I tell you this would happen? I knew you to be a merciful and gracious God. What a terrible thing to say about God. He's upset because God's merciful and gracious. What does this text tell us here in Isaiah? Even though God is just and God is holy and that justice at some point must be carried out, what does God also desire? God desires long-suffering. God desires patience. God desires salvation. What does 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 tell us? Everyone would come, God desires, everyone would come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants everyone to be saved. So God cannot just act in his justice because then how many of us would make it? None. So God's mercy and compassion is also mentioned here. Therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. Blessed are all those who wait for him. The word wait can also be translated here long for. The word speaks of an earnest expectation and hope. They could have had hope. They could have had confidence if they would have trusted in God. I'm going to mention a, a verse to you to write down if you'd like. Write down number 6, 22 to 27. It's referred to as the, the priestly blessing. Number 6, 22 to 27. Even if you don't know the book chapter verse off the top of your head, if you go look at number 6, 22, you're going to know what that section is. All right, verses 19 to 26. We've got two more sections here, verses 19 to 26. I'll, I'll read this just so we can, can go faster through it and finish this chapter. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn the right hand to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left, you will also defile the covering of your images of silver and the ornament of your molded image of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing. You will say to them, "Get away." Then he will give you the rain for your seed, with which you sow the ground, and bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful, and that day your cattle will feed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed with the shovel and fan. There will be on every high mountain and every high hill, rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their womb. Now, we ask this question frequently. I'm going to ask it again here. What's the tone of this section? Has it shifted now? It was very dark. It was very judgmental. It was very full of promise of destruction. But now, what do we see? God's justice is evened out, we might say, is, 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 is coupled with this mercy. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Right. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, uh, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, he shall direct your paths. First Peter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Um, that God will, will deliver us from temptation, he'll provide a way of escape so that we can bear it, 1 Corinthians 10 uh, and 13. We're seeing through all of these things that, that God will continually provide these things. Think about, uh, not only do we think of a spiritual sort of blessing, but does it also seem to imply there are physical blessings here? Is that a biblical concept? Now, we're not saying that it's a health and wealth gospel. God's not going to make all of us rich just because we love him. However, does the Bible tell us God will bless us? What about Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 6 and verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. He was just talking about people who said, don't, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to... All these things the Gentiles seek that, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You might think about that verse uh, in reference to, to this section. So they're going to have what? They're going to have grace. They're going to have God's answer. They're going to have deliverance. 
Verse 21 and 22, they're going to have teaching and they're going to have purified religion. Then they're going to have physical increase. What's the, the idea of verse 26? The light of the moon is going to be like the light of the sun. The light of the sun is going to be sevenfold. The contrast continually in the Bible between light and dark is what? In light there is hope and light and guidance and purity. Darkness, there's destruction, there's pain, there's sickness, there's evil, there's corruption, there's sin. We see that light and dark contrast throughout the scriptures. Very quickly for this section, in spite of Judah's rejection, a promise remained. Just as God heard their cry in Egypt, if you want to write that down, Exodus 3, 7 to 9, so he would hear the cry of those in Judah who repented and turned to him. The word for affliction in this text is also oppression. Think about what other nations were doing to them. Judges chapter 2, verses 14 to 19 was that cycle where they would fall away from God. God would allow them to be oppressed by other nations. They'd cry out for God's deliverance. God sent them a judge. They'd get back right with God, and then they'd go through that whole cycle again. So though there would be oppression, uh, there was then also going to be this, this hope. It's mentioned that this is the only time that God is referred to as a teacher by Isaiah. The results of hearing the teacher would be to walk in his way and to remove their idols. Write down, if you would, Matthew 23, 8, where Jesus says uh, not to be called teacher. Now, we see the word teacher in English mentioned other times uh, in the New Testament, but not in the way that Jesus mentioned it. Uh, we might think of the word master in a place where Jesus mentions teacher in Matthew 23, 8. God's blessings then also here described in terms of agricultural abundance that he would give them. All of these are considered metaphorical terms representing God's providential care. God is going to be with them and guide them and care for them. All right, let's read through the last section here, 27 to 33. We've only got a minute or so left, but we can still certainly see what's happening in this section. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger. His burden is heavy, his lips are full of indignation, and his tongue like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream which reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of futility. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. We've seen holy one of Israel, now we see mighty one of Israel. The Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard, and show the descent of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire with scattering tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be beaten down as she strikes with the rod. And in every place where the staff of punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with tambourines and harps, and in battles of brandishing he will fight with it. For Tophet was established of old, yes, for the king it is prepared. He has made it deep and large, its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. Now, it doesn't take very much for us to think about the tone of this section, does it? The tone of this section is incredibly, overpoweringly uh, victorious for God and for his people, uh, but certainly one of punishment, destruction, and dismay for Assyria. The name of the Lord stands for all that he is. For those who refuse to honor that name, he comes forth as a mighty warrior to defeat the enemies. Write down, if you would, a note, Hebrews 10 and verse 31. Festivals here are mentioned. It was a time for rejoicing. The temple of Mount Zion was a symbol of the presence of God. We might think about the mercy seat. And the word here uh, in verse 29 is not really uh, mighty, but it is really rock. Remember what way God's name was used as rock before? Chapter 26 and 4, that, that rock of ages, essentially that rock forever. That's the way that God is referred to. The figure of the arm of the Lord was frequently used by Isaiah to depict judgment upon evildoers and protection of his people. And then lastly, look at the last section here. Of, I've got to note. The king of Assyria, representing a nation of bloodthirsty people, would be destroyed. A word here, Tophet, it says, was ready to receive him. This was a site in the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem. Solomon had sinned there by erecting uh, something to Molech, 1 Kings eleven seven. Other kings had followed this example by offering their sons and daughters to Molech in the valley of Hinnom. Jeremiah 7, 13. I'll mention these very quickly. Jeremiah 7, 13, 32, 35. 
and Ezekiel 16, 20 to 22. Josiah then, though, turned it into a dump ground where it was said that the fire never went out. The word Gehenna that we would use to define hell that we see in the New Testament is the word derived from the Hebrew name meaning Valley of Hinnom. I'll mention a couple of verses there too. Matthew 5, 22. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Matthew 10, 28. And James 3, 6. So you see exactly the, the measure of destruction that God is intending with the idea of Tophet there and its connection to that, that never ceasing fire in the Valley of Hinnom. All right. That's all for this morning. Lord willing, we'll come in next week and we will begin in chapter 31. Jonathan Robert, you can we like to welcome all our guests. If you are a visitor, you are our honored guest. And if you would, uh, in front of you is some Bibles and some song books. If you could get one of the visitors' cards, fill it out and just leave it on the pew so that we may be of service to you in any way that you need. For those members watching on Facebook, please uh, click like so that we know you are with us. If you are here worshiping today, please put your phone on silent or on vibrate so that you won't disturb the folks worshiping around you. If you're in need of a nursery or training room, go back out the double doors, turn left. First door is the training room. Second door to the left is the nursery. Please keep these members in your prayers. Brother Adam Zach is still having trouble with his coughing. He's here today. Keep him in prayer. Donna Hines is recovering from her right shoulder replacement. Former member Bobby Knight is in rehab, recovering from a stroke. Zach and Amanda Pettis' granddaughter, Kamara, has been on medication to help her with her hearing loss, but had to pause for another week due to low blood count. Sister Josephine Spear is battling headaches. We'd like to extend our sympathy to the family of Brother Willard Dunn, who passed away last Sunday. His service was here at the building on yesterday. Uh, on yesterday, someone who attended the funeral lost their wallet. If anyone finds a wallet, please give it to any deacon, any elder, or our preacher. We have a men's breakfast and business meeting on Saturday, December 2nd at 8.30 a.m. in the men's fellowship hall. The elders want to really emphasize we need all brothers there. Doesn't matter what age you are, we need all the men to uh, show up there. Holiday baskets will be prepared and distributed on Saturday, December 9th at 9.30 a.m. in the fellowship hall. If you would like to donate to this effort, please see Lee or Natalie Fisher. The ladies' holiday potluck and ornament exchange, which was planned to be in the fellowship hall, has been moved to the home of Sister Creta Bells on December 14th at 6 p.m. Please sign up on the ladies' information board Go out the double doors, look to your right. The first board on the right is the ladies' information board in that little hallway there. On the first uh, Sunday morning in January, Brother Lee Fisher is going to start a Sunday school class in the classroom here on the corner uh, from the Foundation's uh, book series. So if you would like to attend that class, please sign up on the, on the sign-up sheet. We want to make sure that we have enough books for everybody that's going to attend his uh, Sunday morning class. Brother Kenneth Sellers needs prayer for his mother-in-law, Darla. She is in ICU at this time at uh, Seton Hospital and having heart issues. Jonathan Smith Sr. is in Japan on an exercise and he requests your prayers for safety and a safe return. Are there any other announcements from the elders, deacons, or the preacher? Serving this morning, first prayer, Brother Roger Dean, song leader. Who is the song leader? Okay. Song leader, <laughs> Brother Williams. Scripture reading, Jonathan Smith, Sermon Field McIntosh, Communion Offering, Ivan McIntosh, Gianni, okay, Gianni Griffin, and closing prayer, Daryl Hickabop. Let's worship the Lord. Okay. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Jim Dukes. He's having a lot of medical issues at this time. So continue to pray for him. Um, 
Oh, he's traveling. Okay. And that he'll get back safely. Any other announcements? All right. Would you all bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we come before you, Father, before your throne of grace, thanking you for all that you have blessed us with in this life. Father, there are many of our number that have health issues, sicknesses. We pray for each one of them, Father, and we pray that they will look to you for the, the help and strength at this time. Father, we have many military that are in different parts of the world. We pray for their safety, that they return here with us once again. And we pray for Brother Jim as he travels, give him a safe trip to his location and return here to us in a safe manner. Father, here on this earth, we are only human and sometimes we fall short of your glory. And we pray, Father, for your forgiveness in that we are able to come to you in prayer and ask for your forgiveness. And through your love and kindness, we pray that you will forgive us. Father, there are, are those that are not here, and we pray for them, Father, that something may be said, a done, an act of kindness, a word, or something that, that will hit, touch their hearts, that they come to you and ask that they would learn how to be uh, one of your children. Father, as we enter into this service, we are so thankful for, for Phil and Michelle and his family as they work here with us. We pray for them, Father. We pray for our elders, Father, as they continue to guide this congregation, shepherd it in a way, and we pray that they will always look to you for the wisdom and guidance to do so. We, again, thank you, Father, for all that you have blessed us with. We can never repay you for anything, but we are so glad that you loved us enough that you gave your son for us. And it's through his blessed name we pray. And amen. Please open your song books to hymn number 347. 347. You have it? Let us sing. There's a happy land of promise over in the grave beyond, where the saved of earth shall soon a glory share, where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy over there, over there, will be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praises through the never-ending ages. Everybody will be happy over there. There the ransomed of all ages will be singing round the throne in that land where no one ever knows a care. And the Christians of all nations will join in the triumph song. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy over there. Rover there will be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praises through the never-ending ages. Everybody will be happy over there. We will hear nobody praying and no mourning in that land. For no burdens there will be for us to bear. And the people will be singing glory, glory to the Lamb. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy 
over there, over there, who will be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praises through the never-ending ages. Everybody will be happy over there. There will meet the one who saved us and who kept us by his grace and who brought us to that land so bright and fair. We will praise his name forever as we look upon his face. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy over there. Over there who will be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praises through the never-ending ages. Everybody will be happy over there. morning. I'll be reading from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. If you would like to mark the song of invitation, that'll be hymn number 348. Song of invitation will be hymn number 348. Song before our lesson will be hymn number 238. If you have it, let us sing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly obey. That moment may enter the heavenly way. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But pure and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice.
rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Good morning. There we go. All right, I have control. There we go. Good to see everybody this morning. Hope everybody had a, a good week, that you had time to rest for a little while at least with your family, friends, or those who are friends that you consider your family. We're going to discuss that in actually just a few moments as we get into our lesson this morning. There's a variety of ways in which we can serve in our lives. A variety of ways in which we can positively impact those around us. When I question for time from time, how can I impact those around me? How can I ensure that I am filling my role as God has designed it for me and has called me into? How can I ensure that I am making a contribution to my group, to my unit, to my family. Generally, we think about this as a physical family, and that is the vein with which we're going to discuss the scriptures this morning and in which we're going to, to study. But this certainly also applies in a, a variety of other places. We might certainly, as we think about family, apply these same types of questions to the church. As I am a part of God's family and as I am a part of Christ's body, Am I fulfilling my role? Am I helping those around me? Am I easing the burden perhaps on others' shoulders? Or am I causing strain? Am I the one that's lagging behind and causing others to, to pick up my slack? Or am, am I the one that is trying to run ahead and, and to pull others with me and to all gain in maturity, in spiritual growth, in progression, in improvement? As we think about the lives that we live, I want to say at the outset of our lesson this morning that I know that not every single one of these scriptures might apply to your specific situation in every way, shape, and form, and that is because we all have different families. We all have different backgrounds. We all currently enjoy different establishments within our home. We know that God instituted a variety of authority constructs and a, a variety of, of institutions, the government, the church, and the home. It's been said before that as goes the home, so goes the church. You can think for a moment of whether or not you agree with that specific conclusion, with that statement or not. We know that God has a design. Just as God had a design for government, as God had a design for church, as God had a design for family, even though God has an intelligently designed, promoted, established unit, not everyone is going to live in that same construct. And that is simply because as a product of our world, sometimes that is a product of age, a product of someone passing from this life and leaving a home, we might feel somewhat incomplete. Perhaps a product of life in which some chase different types of lives and families than others. But also at the core of this is the fact that God's design for marriage, God's design for the home is not shared by everyone in our world. Sometimes through no fault of their own, Oftentimes, it is a personal decision that someone makes. So I want to say from the outset that we're going to discuss three various roles within our families this morning. Where this applies to you, please use the scriptures. Impact your lives and those around you positively. Where these might not specifically in your exact situation apply to you, 
still ask yourself from these scriptures, how can I use these verses to change my life and the lives of those around me? We live in a country where there are a variety of homes that do not have a mother, a father, and children. Though we know in the Bible that is God's design, that is simply not always the case. However, our lesson has been constructed along those lines. Roles for the father, roles for the mother, and roles for the children. We know that as we live in our lives and as we engage with those around us, we, we see, experience, and perhaps live ourselves that family does not always mean family. You might have those that you are related to in a, a blood relation who are not as close to you as others are. Even the Bible shows that there are various types of family. I've only chosen three of these. There certainly are more examples of this in the scripture. But a couple of various types of families. One was Ruth and Naomi. Now you might think as you go back in your mind to the Bible, Ruth and Naomi actually were family. They were family for a period of time, though not blood relation, at least not at that moment. Ruth was married to Naomi's son. And very quickly, we find out through the passage of time in Ruth chapter one that Naomi's husband dies and then Ruth's husband dies. And Naomi tries to send her daughters-in-law back to their homes. Naomi had two sons, had two daughters-in-law. But one day she only had two daughters-in-law because both of her sons, both of those husbands had perished. And so she entreats them. She invites them. She, she motivates them to go back to their homes, go back and, and make new lives. The one daughter-in-law returns, wishes her mother-in-law well, and is going home. Ruth refuses to do that. Even though she is going to go to a strange place and endure perhaps unknown and negative consequences or environment, some troubles, some trials, some times of, of poor, some times of want, some times of struggle. She still says she's going to remain with Naomi. She's not going to leave her mother-in-law. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and the beginning of 17 says, For wherever you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Beginning of verse 17 says, and where you die, I will die. Even though at that moment they were not necessarily related anymore, certainly not because of blood, having a husband passing away, Ruth could have gone back to her family. She wasn't from the place Naomi was from. She didn't know anybody back where Naomi was going. Naomi was going back into God's people's country. Ruth had come from Moab, and she tries to get her to go back to Moab. Ruth says, no, that's not my family anymore. You are my family now. And so she devotes herself to Naomi. She devotes herself so much to Naomi, she implies almost a curse on herself in the last part of verse 17, where she says, God, do more, do so and more to me if anything but death parts us. So there's certainly one strong type of family there. David and Jonathan is another type of family. I want to pause here for just a moment because this is one of the texts in the Bible that people try to defile the Word of God. This is one of the texts where people try to take something that they want perhaps to be there or that they think they can see between the lines and they try to make the Bible teach something the Bible doesn't teach. This is, in my estimation, a product of a modern day agenda wanting to read in certain lifestyles to the scriptures that simply are not there. Now, David was not without women. David was not without family. However, David was a sense of family with Jonathan that he was not with anyone else. Because in 2 Samuel chapter 1, we see kind of a, a funeral lamentation, a lamentation song wherein David mourns the loss of Saul, the king, and Jonathan, his son. And David was so close with Jonathan that he writes there, that he speaks there, the others there in that funeral lamentation song. Your love to me was wonderful, verse 26, 2 Samuel 1, verse 26. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Now, you can imagine in our day and age where people might want to take that verse. And people have for perhaps generations tried to accuse David and Jonathan of having some type of illicit physical con relationship that, that simply is not in the text. There's no need to put it in there. 
David and Jonathan were not, according to the scripture, in any sort of illicit relationship. They had not engaged in any sort of ungodly physical relations or anything of that sort. Their love was simply a pure love between two men. It does exist. David was so close to Jonathan. He said that his love surpassed the love for women. Certainly a, a different family type of unit there. And then the last is Jesus' mother and Jesus' disciple that he loved. That's the way that the New Testament describes it to us. We find in John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, as Jesus is hanging there on the cross, he looks down and he sees his mother and he sees John. And he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. He looks at John and he says, behold your mother. And the Bible tells us from that point, John took Jesus' mother to his house and cared for her. Not the same type of relation we see with Ruth and Naomi or David and Jonathan. But even in the scriptures, since the Bible gives us real accounts of real people, we have different types of family that are mentioned. Look at God's original design for the home. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, after having established what a home was, establishing what a godly ordained relationship was, all the way back in the first couple of chapters of the book of Genesis, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife. The two shall be joined together. They should be one flesh. Jesus quotes this in Matthew chapter 19. It says, whatever God has put together, let not man separate. The idea from the Bible, from God, authorized by the Almighty, is that one man and one woman are united in one union and are designed to be that way, expected to be that way, empowered by God to be that way until death parts one of them. And then within that union, that is the only place where God has allowed, instructed, and in any way authorized a physical sort of sexual relation that will end in children. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Once that house, a mother and a father and children have been established, look what Moses, through the authority of God, tells the nation of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. A godly home, a godly marriage, a godly family is not just a man and a woman meet, a man and a woman gets married, a man and a woman love some, each other so much that one day a child comes along and they continue in that family unit. That's not what a godly designed marriage is. That is what a godly authorized family unit is. But a godly, authorized, and instructed family is a father and a mother and children who are all collectively living by the words of the Almighty, who are all collectively engaged with the expectations from the Almighty, who are all assisting each other on their journey toward heaven. Simply living as a family is not enough to be a godly family. A godly family is one who works together on the pathway to salvation through Jesus, according to God's words. Having said that, I want us to look at the contribution that a father can give, that a mother can give, and that children can give. We're going to discuss this this morning with three points for each one. I hope you brought your Bibles with you. If you did, I'd like you to turn with your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to read all of these scriptures that are mentioned alongside our point this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. Maybe you know some of these verses, and maybe there's some verses that you don't. Let's please go together, open our scriptures, and read what God has to say. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And you fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. 
We're going to use one word for all three of these points. We're going to use one word for fathers, one word for mothers, and one word for children. But we're going to describe it in three different ways. So we're only going to talk about sacrifice this morning. There's a lot of various other types of elements of family life that we can discuss. There's a lot that the Bible has to say about family. We're not going to be able to discuss all of that today, but we will look at this today from one thing that each one can do, but three different ways in which they can do it. So the first is the father's contribution is sacrifice. The father's contribution is to sacrifice for their identity. So when you look at Ephesians 6 and verse 4, it says, Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and, and the admonition of the Lord. There's a variety of ways in which a father can sacrifice for their children's or even their family's identity. Various times we might think we know what someone is or should be. We might think we know how someone ticks and we might try to, to mold them in a particular direction or in a, a particular area of their life. Perhaps you've had parents that have told you at some point that they know you better than you know yourself. You might not like it whenever they say that. I didn't like it whenever I was told that. But we understand as parents, we can see things in our children that they might not be aware of themselves at that moment. One of the things as parents that we might ask ourselves to do is to sacrifice what we want our children to be for how it is that God made them to be. They have various talents various levels of interest in certain areas of life. Some are better at one thing and some are better at another thing. We cannot decide what school our children should go to or what career path they should have. The one thing, though, that we should certainly do is to sacrifice for their spiritual identity. Whether that means some deep conversations, some good conversations, some hard conversations. The father's first goal in life is not to sacrifice so that their child has a better life than they did. That's what we think of as, as parents, right? We want our children to have better than we have. We want our children to enjoy things that perhaps we didn't have the opportunity to enjoy. We want them to, to ascend to heights, whether it's financially or, or educationally or even physically, that we simply could not attain ourselves. But the primary reason for which a father sacrifices for his family is for the strength, the confirmation, and the maturation of their spiritual identity. Yes, there is a time for allowing our children to live how they're going to live. There's a time for allowing our children to make their own decisions. But as we have the opportunity, as we have the authority over them in our home, our goal should be to lead them in one specific direction. That is not a job title. That is not a, a level of education. That is not a level of physical fitness or even mental security. Our primary reason for which we sacrifice for our children is so that they are not children of wrath when they leave our home, but they are children of God. That's the primary responsibility that God has given to us as children parents and to us as fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the lord making whatever personal sacrifices might be necessary to ensure that they are on sound footing turn with me now if you would back to the book of proverbs let's go to chapter number seven proverbs chapter seven A second contribution from fathers would be that we sacrifice for their spiritual development. It is very likely that you have rules in your house. It's very likely that there are things children know they can do, things they know they shouldn't do, and things they know that they cannot absolutely do. Now, when and where and if they flirt with those lines, I, I think it's probably expected that children will do that. I think children are going to, to push the, uh, the, the, the barriers if they can. One of those situations where you tell a child, I don't want you playing in the street, so they get over on the curb and just tight walk the curb very close to the street. Well, I'm not really in the street. Well, you're not technically doing what I told you not to do, but you know I'm not happy with where you are. Our children, 
even though they don't want this, perhaps, are very likely to become more like us than they think that they will. They're likely to think about the world the way that we think about the world because that's the environment in which they have been brought up. That's another area for us as parents to be very careful. Careful how we talk about the church. Careful how we talk about the president. Careful how we talk about politics in general. Careful how we talk about people outside of our homes. Because even though we might not be aware, our children are soaking up all of the things we are teaching them, even when we don't know we're teaching them. You ever seen a, a little boy doing something that looked a little bit odd and you, you find out that he's what he's trying to do at that moment is to, to mimic what he's seen his father do? I don't remember this because I was far too young to remember it. But I was told that, that I was guilty of exactly that same thing one day. I was trying to mimic the hand movements that my dad was using when he was leading singing one day. There's a lot of times when our children are watching us and we are teaching them things about the world. We are teaching them things about life. We are teaching them how to view and react to and speak about the world, even when we don't know they're watching. We need to ensure that we're making personal sacrifices for our children's future, for their spiritual development, because how we speak, how we act, how we think, how we conduct ourselves is going to be taught to our children, even unknowingly. So we need then to purposefully sacrifice from time to time something we might say or a way we might say it, so that the impression we give to our children is one of godliness and not of carefree or carelessness. Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. We want the things that we teach to our children to stay with them throughout their life, because we want the things we have taught our children to be healthful for them. We want the things we have taught our children to be beneficial for them. And of all of the things that we can provide for our children, we might not give them a better life than we had. They might not eat brand name foods. They might not go out to eat very often. They might not have the money to go to the movies with their friends. They might not go on a high school trip to Mexico with the rest of their high school class. There's a lot of ways in which we might feel poorly because we cannot give our children all the things we'd like to give our children. But all that having said and done, you as a father have done your job. If they leave your house knowing God, if they leave your house knowing what's right and wrong and what God expects of them, and they have a desire to fulfill the path that God lays before them. If our children leave our homes and they love God the way we love God, regardless of what else we give our children, we have done our job. We want to give them more. We want our children to have more money than us. We want our children to, uh, to have a, maybe a more healthy family than us. We want our children to have better things than us. We want our children to have better homes than us. We want our children to have better, better education than us. One of the things, though, that we should really desire as parents, and specifically now we're talking about fathers, is we should not only want our children to have better than us, but by our dedicated teaching to them, by the sacrifice of our time that we take time to teach them about God and His Word, we should not only want our children to have better than us, we should want our children to be better than us. We sacrifice for their spiritual development. And then lastly, look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is a little bit of an odd place to go. The context here is specifically talking about widows and that widows should be cared for by their family so that the church is not burdened. However, even though that is the context, I want you to think about how we might use this verse to fulfill a lesson we can give to our children. So number three for fathers, we sacrifice for their security. Now we know that the Bible speaks against idleness. Not little bitty idols that people worship, but idleness, meaning not doing anything, being lazy. One of the, the Bible speaks to the fact that men should work, and if they don't work, they shouldn't eat. We have a responsibility as fathers. I know that we live in a day where the, the workforce is as combined and divided as it has ever been. 
I know that we live in a day and an age where CEOs and CFOs and chairmen and chairwomen, those positions are filled by men and women. My goal for the lesson this morning is not to, to say that we have have in, in some way forgotten how we should live and that women's job is not in the workplace. That, that's not the point of the lesson. The point of the lesson is, regardless of whether or not your wife works, if you have the opportunity to work, you as a father need to be out there working, sacrificing, making money, caring for your family, and showing your young men and women how to care for their family. Because just as I mentioned earlier, they see what we do. They see how we live. They see how we approach the lives that we're living. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. But if any does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We need to show our children what hard work is. We need to show our children that, yes, it's okay to play sometimes. It's okay to relax sometimes. It's, it's okay to go have a picnic or, or go on a vacation sometimes. But when it's time to work, you go to work. When it's time to clock in, you clock in. When your family needs something, you go get what your family needs by work, by dedication, by sacrifice. Now, we certainly can abuse this. We can be gone so long chasing money that we can chase more than our family actually needs, and we can sacrifice the time that we could be spending with our kids by doing that. That's really another conversation for another time. However, we do have a responsibility from God to provide for our own. We need to show our children what that means like to care for our family, to provide for our family. Let's move on to the contributions that a mother can make. We looked at sacrifice for men. For mothers now, for women, we're going to look at support. Turn back to the book of Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs chapter 31. Now, you probably are somewhat, at least most of us are probably somewhat familiar with this text. There is a, a large discussion perhaps to be had about men and women in the Bible. There's a lot of things that people might assume about Christians and their views on women that aren't necessarily true. There's a lot of things that people might hear from some of my lessons or, or some of the comments that I make, and they may assume something that is not true. There's a lot of ways in which our current generation, and specifically our current culture in our country, I don't know how this is globally, but at least in our culture, in our country, it is often assumed that those who are conservative and those who are religious do not value women. It is perhaps assumed by those who are conservative and those who are religious that our viewpoint is that women should be barefoot, pregnant, and only allowed in the home and nowhere else. That's not what we're saying. And if someone, for a moment, ignorantly proclaims that the Bible does not truly value women, they have not been reading their Bible. You know some of the best examples of dedication to God and faith and strength and courage in the Bible are women. Two of my favorite are Hannah and Esther. We don't have time to talk about them this morning. Hannah wants a boy, wants a child so badly that she promises God. She says, God, I'm paraphrasing. God, if you, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. She wants to have a son so badly. She says, God, if you give him to me, I'll give him back to you. How many people try to make a deal with God? Say, God, if, if you get me through this, what's the, what's the first thing that people say? The first thing is probably, God, if you get me through this, I'll be in church next Sunday. God, if you get me through this, I'll fill in the blank, whatever it is. We, we think of things, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll give all these things to you. But then when we get the thing that we desired, we conveniently forget that we attach something to that, right? Say, oh, I, I'll go next time. I'll go next month. I'll go when I get things squared away. I'll go next Easter. You know, people try to, to bargain with God, but then they forget that they had a side to that bargain too. You know what happens when Hannah has her child? Can you imagine 
telling God that you want a child so badly. God gives you that child. You hold that child in your hands and then you say, no, this is my child. I can't let him go. That's not what Hannah does. Hannah sends her son after he is weaned to live with Eli the priest. There is such a sad situation that we read in 1 Samuel chapter 2. At least it's sad to me. I can imagine the, the emotions that Hannah was going through. That it says that Hannah would go up with her family from time to time and worship, knowing that Samuel was there. And as she went up from time to time to worship, year by year, she would make him a little coat to give him every time she would. Can you imagine the tears that might be shed while she's making that little coat that every year she's making that coat a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and that little boy's not living at home with her? But she followed through. She gave that child to God. She dedicated him to the Lord. Esther risked her life going before the king when she was not asked, when she was not summoned. According to the rules in that kingdom at that time, she could have been killed if the king didn't want to see her. Esther risked her life to potentially save and preserve all of the lives of the Jews at that moment who were her countrymen. There's some very strong examples of women in the scriptures. Perhaps the most notable and well-known of all passages that praise women is Proverbs chapter 31. Beginning in verse 10, going all the way through verse 31, it speaks of the virtuous wife. I want to look at, though, at only two verses here. I want you to read with me verses 10 and 11, and we'll see how this fits into the point that we're making. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. The title on the slide says that a mother's contribution is to support for his responsibility. The responsibility of the father is to be the spiritual head of the household. The responsibility of the father is to be the financial head of the household. The responsibility of the father is to be the emotional head of the household. But he cannot be the head of the household he could be. He cannot be the head of the household God wants him to be. He cannot reach to the highest heights of the climax of that mountain of the example God wants him to be. If his wife is not supporting of him. If his wife is not a, a godly help meet alongside him. If his wife does not assist him in growing that family in establishing that rule according to God's law, in imparting to the family the expectations that God has given, in providing a shoulder to lean on, a weir, a, a, an ear to whisper into, a shoulder to cry on if the time comes. Being a leader in a home, being the, the head of the household, from time to time, there may be some struggles. There may be some things that the rest of the family does not know about. The primary goal of the husband is to get himself to heaven. And the secondary goal is to get his wife and children there too. That's much more difficult when he doesn't have the support of his wife. Can he be successful? Sure, he can be successful. The Bible even tells us you can be successful in that situation. But ask yourself this question. Which man would I rather be? Would I rather be Job? who loses family, who loses cattle, who loses respect, and then loses his health, for his body is just covered with boils, so much so that the Bible says he's taking little broken pieces of, of pottery and, and breaking open the boils that he has on his body so he has relief. And then he turns to his wife, the one place that he assumes he's going to have help and, and support and succor and, and, and guide and somewhere soft to lay his head. And his wife tells him, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just get it over with? Or would you rather be Noah? Now, does the Bible tell us that Noah's wife is supportive? Not in so many words, but Noah did something that was really strange. They didn't know what rain was. They'd never seen rain before. The Bible said that the earth was watered with a mist that came up from the ground. And yet here's Noah building this ark. Can you imagine the way that Noah and Noah's family's neighbors would have looked at him when he's out there building this ark that, that, that's a, a football field and a half long? How do I know that Noah's wife was supportive? Because she got on that ark with him. Job's wife said, curse God and die. Noah's wife supports him. A mother can do a great service for God in her family 
if she is supportive of her husband as he seeks to fulfill his responsibility. She can be a strength for him that he might not be able to always be for himself. Number two, we're already in the book of Proverbs. Let's go back to chapter six. Number two, a contribution of the wife and the mother is to support for their education. While the father is expected to be the spiritual head of the household, a lot of times he falls down on the job. While the father is expected to be the spiritual head of the household, he's, he's expected to be the one that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that teaches God's word to his family, that speaks of it when he's sitting down, when he rises up, when he lays down, when he walks by the way. He's supposed to be the one telling his children about God, impressing upon his children the importance of following God. But far, far, far too many fathers are either A, not even there, or B, have absolutely failed in that responsibility. And in that case, where does the leadership of the house naturally fall? A strong, godly woman who still teaches her children what's right and wrong. A strong, godly woman who, by her words, by her example, by her teaching, tells her children about God. Tells her children about the Almighty and about the Lord who died for them. Tells them what is right and wrong, up and down, good and bad. Warns them from the dangerous things in life and continually reminds them to live in the grace of God. Look at Proverbs 6, 20 through 22. My son, keep your father's command. See, but it doesn't stop there. And do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. The words, the teachings, the trainings of a mother have the power and the ability to remain with her children for the rest of their lives. If they'll listen and she's willing to serve in that way. If she's willing to support her husband, to support her family in her children's spiritual education, to teach them the, the safe ways to live life, teach them about the bad things that are out there. You know, it's very possible that though a father might do his responsibility well, there are certain times, there are certain ages, there are certain phases, and there are certain children who simply will listen better to their mother than they will their father. When you've got the opportunity to teach your children, mothers, jump on that train. Teach them everything that you know about God. Teach them everything that you know about life. Supplement the job that your husband should be doing for your children. Now, sometimes that supplement might be most of that teaching. There might be a house where the, the father is either not there or the father is just simply not being the spiritual head that God wants him to be. That doesn't mean that your children can't know about God. That doesn't mean that your children cannot grow up to be incredibly great servants for God. How do we know that? Because there's a man in the New Testament by the name of Timothy, whose father was not a believer, but his mother was strong and his grandmother was strong. We know him to be a very strong young evangelist, receiving two letters from the Apostle Paul and active in the work of the church of the New Testament in the first century. How did Timothy get to know what he knew about the Bible? How did Timothy get to become the young man that he was? Because of his mother. Because she fulfilled her role of supplementing, or maybe having to provide all, of the necessary education for Timothy in his life. Lastly, look at 1 Peter chapter 3. A responsibility, an opportunity, to contribute to the family by the mother is to support her family for their example. Now, this applies to children, yes, but it also applies to more than that. What happens if you live in one of those families where the mother is a strong Christian or the wife is a strong Christian in the case that there's no children in that household, but the father's not? Maybe the father believes in God, but he doesn't follow God. He doesn't love God. 
He doesn't live like God has called him to live. What is a godly woman to do in that scenario? Just give it up? So, well, I have no control over my family. Don't ever think that you don't have control in your family. Don't ever think that you are without impact in your family. First Peter chapter three, beginning in verse one, wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands. That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. God has called us to be, in our marriage relationships, a beacon for the Lord. Now, God's design for the home is a father who's there and a mother who's there who both love God. That's not always the case. In a situation where that's not always the case, the one who does love God can live their way in the sight of God and in the sight of their, in this situation, husband, so that they can continually present a godly example to them. They can show their husband what they're missing out on. They can show their husband what God has called them to be. They can show their husband what God expects even him to be. Maybe they listen to your teaching. Maybe they don't. But they'll notice your example. They'll notice how you think. They'll notice how you speak. They'll notice how you react. And they'll know come Sunday where you are. And they'll know come Wednesday where you are. And they'll know come ladies class and gospel meeting and church event after church event where you are. Strong, godly women are called upon by God to give a strong, godly example to their family, supporting their family as an example. As we look at the very last of our points this morning, we'll look at a child's contribution. We're going to talk about some things over the next couple of minutes that, that might seem pretty common sense. I say, well, I already knew those kind of things. That, that's fine. But I still would encourage you to pay attention, especially as we get to one of the last ones. So the father has a contribution of sacrifice. The mother has a contribution of support. And the children have a contribution of submission. Let's go back to Proverbs and go back to chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. Submit for their effectiveness. Well, who's effectiveness? Well, who's supposed to teach them? Their parents are, right? Ideally, it'd be a mother and a father. But in some situations, it might be a father. In some situations, it might only be a mother. In some situations, it may be grandparents or aunts and uncles or someone else who is in that, that parental role over you as a child. For their effectiveness as good teachers of what is right and good and holy, they can only be so effective as you as children allow them to be effective. If you are stiff-necked, insolent, rebellious, cruel, ungodly, there's only so effective your parents can be. They can show you the way of God, but they can't make you live it. They can impress upon you why you should live in the way of God, but they can't make you live it. That's a desire that you have to have. Hopefully, from a very young age, your, children, your fathers and mothers have impressed upon you the importance of submission to God. Hopefully, you have seen submission to God in their example. There's a lot of things our parents can tell us are good for us. Our parents can tell us, don't do those things. They're dangerous. Well, their teaching's effective if we listen. If we go ahead and do those things that are dangerous, our parents haven't failed, but we have limited their effectiveness by our stubbornness. So submit. So the effectiveness of your parents teaching you according to the words of God can reach their mark. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord will not allow the righteous soul to famish, but he casts away the desire of the wicked. We might not always understand what our parents want from us. 
We might not always understand why our parents teach us the things that they do. We might not understand all of the lessons that they try to give. But for the most part, hopefully we have righteous parents, good godly parents. Even if they're not righteous and godly parents, they still should have our best interest at heart. We do damage to their impact on our lives when they teach us things that are good when we don't listen to them. Look at the, the statement that's made in verse 1. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. I don't know of much greater pain than a parent could have than them having taught their children about God, having taught their children about the kingdom having taught their children about the Lord. And those children grow up and decide they don't want the Lord. Those children grow up and decide they don't want the kingdom. Effective parents who are righteous, holy, godly, not perfect, but righteous, holy, and godly. Living out their best life to teach their children the truth while they're living at home. It is not the parent's fault. If a child decides when they're grown, they don't want that pathway anymore. Think of a parent that has spent 18 plus years trying to impress upon their children a desire, a love, a want for God. Parents don't want their children to endure physical pain because of their own poor decisions. Parents don't want to endure phone calls with negative news on the other end because their child has made a poor decision or has been the victim of some poor decision because they were spending their time in places where they should never have been to start with. A parent certainly, though, never wants to hear this. No, I'm not going to church with you that morning. No, I'm not going to church. No, I don't believe that anymore. I'm not even sure I believe in God. No parent wants to hear that. Who knows how many times a parent's prayer may be full of desire for improvement in their children's life over them. But most importantly, that their children are Christian young men and women. Are Christian men and women adults. Are Christian husbands and wives. Are Christian mothers and fathers. Children limit the effectiveness of their parents' teaching when they teach them God's word if they don't submit to the lessons their parents are trying to teach them. Number two, submit for the rest of your life. Turn back over to the book of Ephesians. I know we're going back and forth quite a bit. I hope that you are, are following along, at least listening, if not turning your pages with me. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Notice that it doesn't end there. He doesn't just say obey. He doesn't just say listen. This is the first commandment with promise. What is the promise? That it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, that doesn't guarantee that we're going to live to be 80, 85, 95 years old. What it does mean is we as children submit to the teachings and the rules and the construct of authority in the homes of our parents wherein we live. Because if we live according to the teachings they're trying to give us, we will have a healthier life, especially if they are good, godly Christian parents. A lot of times kids may think that their parents make rules just for their own fun. Well, who do they think they are to tell me I have to come back at this time or I have to be here at that time or I have to tell them where I am or, or whatever it is? Parents don't make rules just because you, you think parents sit up late at night in the bed just getting ready to go to bed and they think to themselves, what, what, what kind of crazy rule can we come up with tomorrow? What kind, of, what kind of crazy rule can we come up with and tell them, I, I want you home at, at 8.37 and, and, and not a minute later? You know, I think our kids are having too much fun. Let's make their life harder. No parent does that. 
That's not the kind of rules that they're making. Parents make rules for what? For the safety and security and growth of the child. Not to make their lives worse. We may not understand the rules, but we will one day. When you're a husband and a wife, a father and a mother, when you have your first child, you'll understand why you got told no so many times. You'll understand why there were certain rules, why there were certain expectations, why there were certain requirements. Because you have just been tasked with this life in your hands and you think, did God really just give me the responsibility to make sure this thing keeps living? Did God really just give me this life and now I'm in charge of how it lives? I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to ruin it. Anybody think they ruined their firstborn? Is that why we had a second one? Don't answer that. You know, sometimes the, I guess the first one's a guinea pig. I was an old, uh, the, the oldest child, so I'll say that about myself. I guess my parents thought they could do better, so they had two more. We're not making rules to make our kids' life worse. We're making rules because we have been tasked with one of the greatest responsibilities in the world, and that is nurturing, training, and transporting to adulthood a little bitty life. And we don't want the world to hurt them. We don't want the devil to hurt them. We don't want them to hurt themselves. So we make rules. Children need to be willing to submit to those rules. Because if we live by the rules that our Bible-knowing, God-loving parents have given us, they will make us better adults. They will make us better husbands and wives. They will make us better mothers and fathers. They will make us better servants in the kingdom. They will put us on the best path to a long life of peace in this world. We need to submit to these rules and teachings. Number three, turn with me to Matthew chapter five. This one's the interesting one that I wanted to mention. This one sounds like it's for children and it is, but this one's also for adults. Children need to submit to their parents for their mindfulness. Now, what does he mean by that? Read the verses with me first. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It might be the case that you have a young man or a young woman who, because their parents have taught them, they've heard about God, they have believed in the Lord, they've obeyed the gospel. They, even though they are 20 or 30 years younger than their parents, they are their brother or sister in Christ. And it might come to be that the child, in some areas, is more faithful to God than the parent. It might be that there's an area where the parent is deficient in their spiritual life. It might be that there is a situation where the parent might tell someone, hey, just call in sick to work today. Somebody calls they don't want to talk to or somebody knocks on the door they don't want to see. Just tell them I'm not home. Child says, I can't do that. <laughs> Children, either pure in heart when they're small or with a dedicated heart to God, once they have been old enough to hear the gospel and obey it, can be Christian examples to their parents, to remind even their parents what's right and what's wrong. To impress upon their parents the way that they should think about life, the way that they should think about other people. You know that a child who hasn't been taught, a child who has not been taught that there's a difference, can make friends with another child their same size with any color of skin. They may look different, but they don't think anything about them because they haven't been taught anything different than that. They haven't been shown anything exists different between somebody who's white, black, brown, yellow, green, or any other kind of color. They don't know there's a difference other than somebody's got a different color skin than them. There's a variety of things that children can teach parents, either by their pure hearts when they're little or by their dedication to God when they're older. 
This can still happen even when a child is grown and out of the house, 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. We can still teach our parents what is right and what is wrong. And we as parents can still be impacted from our children by what is right and what is wrong. Because when the children submit to God, and the parents see that child's submission to God and dedication to God, it can from time to time even impact the parent to impact their mindfulness of how they should be thinking about others or how they should be thinking about this topic or how they should be speaking or living. Children's contribution to the family is to submit for their parents' effectiveness, to submit for the benefit of the rest of your life, and to submit to God for the mindfulness of your parents and remind them this is right and this is wrong. None of us are perfect, and that includes fathers and mothers. Fathers and mothers of two-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and 42-year-olds. None of us are perfect. We can still learn lessons from those around us. Now, it might be a humbling lesson to learn, but it's still a productive lesson for us as parents is because our children have dedicated themselves to God. If they have submitted themselves to God and they give us an impact and we think, you know, that's right, that I should be doing that too. If we realize something that we're not doing right, that our children are doing right, then God is going to be glorified and we're going to be stronger Christians because of it. There are a variety of ways in which we are living in the same house or out of the same house that fathers, mothers, and children can impact their families. God's blueprint is this family is joined together by God and stays together. Two are better than one, Ecclesiastes writes, because they have a good, they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. There is strength in numbers. There's strength in our families, especially when our families belong to God. Let's answer the question this morning, and we're finished. How can I impact my family? Your family might not look like everybody else's family. You might not have a father and a mother and children living in the same home. You might have only a father. You might have only a mother. You might have both, but only one of them loves God. You might have a father and a mother and the children have left the house. Regardless of what your family unit looks like, you can impact your specific family. How do you do that? Look at the scripture up on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge. In every place. How can I impact my family? Talk about the Lord. Live like the Lord asks you to live. And impress upon everyone in your house the expectations the Lord has for all of us and what's truly needful in life. That goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, doesn't it? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, if we talk about Him, if we pray to Him, if we read about Him, if we speak of Him to our children and to our spouses, if we diffuse the knowledge of Christ amongst our families, we have impacted our families. How can I impact my family? There's a variety of things we've talked about this morning that you can use to impact your family. But the number one way that you can impact your family is you take the knowledge of the Lord and you speak of it and you live it out in your family unit. And you can impact whatever your family looks like. You can impact that family. God has invited every single one of us to be a part of his family this morning. He asks us to hear his word, to believe in that word, to believe in him and his son and what has been done for us, that the Lord died on the cross for our sins. That the Lord established his church and gave us the opportunity to be a part of it. He asks us to repent of our sins, to turn away from our former lives and tell God that we'll live how he wants us to live, to confess the identity of Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior, and then to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, coming up out of that water, having been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
for the forgiveness of our sins. We come up out of that water fresh, new, clean, a brand new creature, a part of the Lord's body, a part of the Lord's family, the closest family, the best family that we'll ever experience in this life. God gives us a, we might think of it as a, a preview of what heaven will be like here on earth, of living around those who love God and who love each other because they love God. God invites you to be free from the things in this world that drag you down, from the sin that has made your life worse, has invited you to be a part of his son's body by obedience to the gospel. If you've not done that this morning, don't put it off until it's too late. If you're ready this morning, then make that decision this morning to give your life to God and become a part of his family. If you don't quite know what's required of you yet by God, then find someone and ask them for a Bible study, and we will find somebody to study with you. If you have already made that decision this morning, if you're already a part of the Lord's body, if you're already a part of the Lord's family and something in your life between you and God is not what it should be, and the church can help you this morning, pray with you and for you, whatever that need might be, we invite you this morning, if you need to, to come while we stand and while we sing. Calling to day, why from the sunshine of love will thou roll farther and farther away? Calling, calling to day, to day, calling, calling to day, to day. Jesus is tenderly calling today, it's tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed, he will not turn thee away. Calling, calling today, today. Calling, calling today, today. Jesus is tenderly calling today. He is calmly calling today. Jesus is waiting, oh, come to him now, waiting today, waiting today. Come with thy sins at his feet, lowly bow, come and no longer delay. Calling, calling today, today. calling, calling today. Jesus is tenderly calling today. He is tenderly calling today. Jesus is pleading, oh, listen to his voice. Hear him today. Hear him today. They who believe in his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise and away. Calling, calling today, today. Calling, calling today, today. Jesus is tenderly calling today. It is tenderly calling today. You may be seated. To prepare for the Lord's Supper, please turn your hymn books to 208 208. If you have it, let us sing. Tis midnight and on all is brown. The star is dim that lately shone. Tis midnight and on all is 
If you did not get a communion packet, please raise your hand and one will be brought to you. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is the blood of this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then in Matthew chapter twenty seven and and verse fifty. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Let's pray for the bread. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done, for all that you've given us. You sent your son to die that cruel death on the cross for our sins. He was sent down. He knew that he came here to teach and then to die for our sins. Lord, he lived a sinless life. And they sped upon him. They slapped him. The crown of thorns was twisted upon his head and beaten into his head. He carried his cross to Golgotha. His hands and feet were nailed to that cross. And he died on that cross for our sins. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Let's pray for the cup. Lord, again, we thank you for all that you've done for you sending your son to die on, to die on that cross for our sins. He hung upon that cross. His side was pierced and blood and water came spilling out. And he died that night on the cross for our sins. His blood was shed for our sins, which we did not deserve. But now we have the opportunity to be with you in heaven. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. In verses 1 and 4 of 101, 1 and 4 of 101. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all, to him I freely give, I will live the life and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, Lord. I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. This is a part of our service, separate from communion, where we take the time to uh, give up an offering up to God and uh, give thanks to him for all he's given to us. I'll be reading in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Let us pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today, God, uh, just praying that you bless us so that we may offer up to you all that we have, Lord. We pray that we have the right mind and the right heart in giving back to you, Lord, because you've given us so much. You've given us families, friends, and just many opportunities in this life to not only grow closer with each other, but grow closer with you. And I pray, Lord, that as we get ready to give back to you, that you bless us to give with a cheerful heart and not just uh, out of our abundance, but out of everything that we have, Lord. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
And if you'd like to give on your way out, there's a box in the foyer. If you're willing and able, please stand. We'll have one psalm before our closing prayer. I found the book, so it'll be on the screen. Let us sing. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. <clears throat> Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be your living sanctuary for you. Lord, teach your children. To stop the fighting, start uniting all as one. Let's get together, loving forever, sanctuary for you. And when he comes with shouts of glory and our work is gone, earth is done, know how I long for him to tell me faithful sir. Well done. As we prepare to conclude, last week we mentioned about when our sister placed her membership here. She happens to be here. Um, Barbara Anderson, could you come forward, please? After we conclude in prayer, let us greet her, thank her, and encourage her as being part of this body here. As Brother Darren come forward to clue. Our Heavenly Father will come before thee now, asking you to be before this Christian as she proclaims her faith to you, and she asks for forgiveness for all the things that have been done in the past. We are also neglectful, and we also ask that you forgive us too. We ask that you look down upon us as your children, that we make mistakes, and we we love you. And that we ask that you forgive us. Be with us through this day now. And bless her in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>